So let's go and have a look at today's agenda. So we've got John, um, as I said, is our MD, and Neil, our scheduling specialist, taking you through the session today. They're going to cover some of the key principles of the super scheduler. So looking at things like sequencing and why it's why it's important, the difference between finite capacity scheduling and um, infinite capacity scheduling, what the, the benefits of each. We'll also look at interfacing and data exchange. So looking at uh, interfacing to third party ERP systems and the types of data that you might pass back between the systems. We'll also then look into more detail at some of the key features of the software uh, and then extending to the shop floor. So things like shop floor data collection, machine monitoring and passing data and, and, and basically enriching your data and getting a more of a live view of the status of your shop floor activity and the jobs on the shop floor. We'll also then look at common scenarios. So things that you might be experiencing in your business, some of the challenges or events that might be taking place and how you could use the Seeky Scheduler to help overcome those or respond to those challenges. So I'm going to hand over to John now and he's going to start off with the key principles of the Scheduler. Thank you, John. Thank you, Jamie. <clears throat> so before we we dive into the detail of, of some of the functionality of the system, um, I think it's worth just going through some key principles just to make sure that we're all um, have a, a common understanding. We do have or we do find that there are some misconceptions with scheduling and not least the fact that and um, whatever you do, you've not got enough capacity to get everything out on time and putting in a computer system like the scheduling system, a software system will cure that. So there are some fundamental things that the scheduler can't do. If you physically haven't got the capacity to get the product out the door, then the system's not going to cure that for you, but we'll certainly show you how we can help identify some solutions for that. Um, so what we're going to talk about, so the scheduling system, in effect, it says using calculations at the top of my slide, it's a number cruncher. What it can do, it can do things very quickly or much more quickly than you can do things manually. And what it will provide is the ability to predict when and where you can carry work out based on the capacity you've got in an efficient and time effective sequence. I'll say at this point, and I may say it at several points through the presentation, it can never produce the, any better schedule than you're able to do manually with all of your experience. But what you'll see is it that can keep that up to date. Um, and you can see the impact of things that may change very quickly, which is impossible to do with any other system. So what's the scheduler going to do? Well, it's going to generate a schedule based on your actual capacity. And Jamie already mentioned we're going to talk a little bit about the differences between infinite and finite capacity a little bit later on in this presentation. It will enable you to try different options when you're scheduling work and whether you want to prioritize certain work, whether you want to um, put some overtime on and see the impact of that, how you prioritize work generally. Do you just automatically schedule by the delivery date? The things that you need tomorrow are the things that you should be making today. Well, you'll see some examples later on where that may not be the best solution. The system will automatically take into account independencies between operations within a works order. So typically they would done, be done sequentially, although there are some options to override that. But also um, in the dependencies between works orders within a bomb structure. So within an assembly or sub-assembly, you can't produce the sub-assembly until you've manufactured all the relevant parts and works orders that go to make up that sub-assembly. And one of the the most important benefits, having spent some time um, producing this optimum schedule, whether you did that in the Seeky scheduler or you did it in your Excel spreadsheet, what you'll see is how the system can be kept up to date to reflect the real status of work on the shop floor. So whether things finish early or whether they're delayed. And that's almost impossible to do with an Excel sheet. Generally, you have to run around the shop floor, collect timesheets every morning, go and find out the status of what was completed yesterday, and then replan based on um, the current status of work in progress. The scheduling system will do that automatically for you. This means that you can get early indications of problems. So if work that you scheduled to complete last night is not completed, then hopefully you'll be seeing that during the day because the system will be taking into account the progress of the work 
maybe the quantities that you've made during the shift and you'll see that this job is going to be pushed out to run into today and that will have an impact on other jobs on that resource and possibly other resources depending on how the sequence of operations flows down through other um, resources. We can also use not so much just the scheduler but coupled with our shop floor data collection system to, to look at performance against the plan. So two things that we tend to look at here, standard times versus actual time. So are the times in your ERP system really um, representative of how long things are actually taking you on the shop floor? And also um, schedule adherence. So we plan all this work to be done this week, but how closely are we really adhering to that schedule? What the scheduler will also do is enable us to use people's time more effectively. And I've got another slide um, a little bit later on that will explain to you in three different areas how we can save time and use those people on more productive tasks. So finite capacity, how do we define finite capacity in the scheduling system? Well, you might think finite capacity is just the shifts that we run. That's all that we need to enter into the system, but it is more than that. Generally speaking, we will have an efficiency on a resource. It would be a very brave scheduler or planner that schedules their um, resources or machines to run at 100% efficiency, unless you build in a lot of lost time into your standard times, which is not the preferred practice. Your standard time should record accurately how long you should take to make things assuming that you make it exactly to time. The machine effect efficiency will enable you to mimic reality. How much of the time are your machines really spending when they're being set or run? Because that's what we're going to be scheduling. All of the other time when we have a breakdown, where the operator's not available, where he's just lost 15 minutes because he's gone to the tool stores and can't find the tools. Those are maybe day-to-day -day custom practice. So do we really need to schedule our machines and resources to 60%, 70%, 80% efficiency? That's something that we'll also put into the system. The capability of the machine and the operations it can produce. We may have a small cell of, of machines. They can all do the same work other than if we get particularly large components where they will only go on one machine because it has a larger bed or a larger chuck. So that we need to understand as well. There are other things that will constrain, not so much just the capacity, but when we can actually manufacture things. So do we need particular people to run particular machines? If that member of staff is, is absent, how do we accommodate that? Is there wait times between operations? If we have, for example, a painting operation, we can't assemble until the paint's dried. And what about availability of material? Great, we want to try and start everything as quickly as we can and deliver to the customer. That doesn't really work if we have to wait two weeks for the material. So we're going to cover all of these things um, during the presentation. I mentioned how the scheduler helps you save time and I, I've identified here three ways that, that you'll see the benefit of implementing the scheduling system. The first one is that we can predict results on a realistic picture of view of your factory, your facility and the capacity it has. And as I said previously, and I, I did say I might repeat myself on this point, you may be doing that currently in Microsoft Project, you might be doing it in Excel, you might be doing it on a, on a whiteboard. You might even be using one of the wooden um, planning boards with a T-card system, if you can remember um, that far back. And you will produce a good schedule, whichever method you use, you'll produce a good and an optimal schedule. But it will take you a lot longer than if you allow the CQ scheduler to do it because it will crunch the numbers much more quickly. And you will then refine and optimize that schedule um, as we go through. So with, it, with an accurate predictor of your production capacity and that workload, the other thing that the scheduling system will offer you is that if you want to change things or if things change outside of your control, for example, um, a due date on an order is being pulled forward because it's critical or that you have a machine breakdown. The scheduling system will show you that very quickly. Um, whereas in your Excel sheet, you have to do a lot of rework on that Excel sheet. And finally, the schedule is kept up to date. You don't need 
to check with people on the shop floor what they're doing because by booking the data and there's a couple of methods they could do that either using Seeky or using another system that data can automatically be uploaded into the scheduler it's pretty well close to real time but the important thing is that data is available for when you reschedule again I'm just going to talk a little bit more about infinite versus finite capacity now. Um, I'm, I'm going to assume everyone is, is aware of the differences, but just to be clear, because there may be some people that are new to scheduling principles to us. So infinite capacity assumes you have an empty factory. If you have a job that's going to take you a week to make, then using inf infinite capacity, we're going to use a week's lead time for that part but it won't make any difference how busy the factory is as to whether we adjust that lead time and if I've only got one resource I can take 10 jobs in and as far as infinite capacity is concerned I can produce them all in a week obviously we can't it's going to take us 10 weeks so that's the difference between infinite and finite capacity so what does this lead to number one infinite capacity you really have no idea when you're actually going to produce work, it's more that you have an idea when you need to produce it by. So therefore, it can lead to high stocks of raw material because you need material in the warehouse because you don't have an accurate view of when you're actually going to produce the work in the manufacturing areas. Secondly, it can lead to late deliveries because you really don't understand exactly when you're going to manufacture um, product. You have to base order promise dates for customers on some nominal lead time, six weeks, eight weeks, two weeks. And it is rare that customers are routinely updating those lead times based on how things change within their factory. And it means that resources may not be used efficiently, so they may become overloaded, um, um, you, whereas work that you can assign to other machines, you don't easily see that. Secondly, there is a chance you're starting um, work long before you can actually complete it because it sits on the shop floor waiting to get onto a bottleneck machine, which means that the value of your whip increases, which also is going to tie up cash in your business. One of the other key principles that's important is you will instruct or you will be able to tell the scheduler how you want it to load job onto its planning board. So it has a graphical planning board. You will see some example screenshots of that later on. Um, and I just want to explain why the way that the, sh the scheduling system loads work onto that planning board is key and important. Um, and it's something that you will have control over when you're scheduling. So on the left hand side here, we've got some orange ping pong balls and they're going to represent the operations I'm going to schedule. And the glass tube in the middle of the screen is my capacity. So we fill up the glass tube and you can see that we filled up our capacity with all of our operations and we've probably got what? two thirds, three quarters of capacity used. So we go on putting more jobs in and eventually we fill up the capacity. And then we've got some much smaller jobs represented by these small little pellets ball bearings here. So we can put those into the jar and you'll see we completely fill up the capacity with all the larger, longer running jobs with the smaller jobs fitted in between them. Now take the example that we do the smaller jobs first, as in we schedule those first. They fill up half of our capacity. We then do the longer jobs afterwards, and it means that half of the work of those longer running jobs, we've not got the capacity to schedule. So this is controlled by the scheduling rule that, that um, you select. And as you can see on the right hand side of the screen, there's a number of different ones. We're not going to th go through all of those, but I'm gonna hand over to Neil, who's our scheduling specialist, and he's going to talk you through the detail now of some of the options available here. We will also cover them at some of the scenarios towards the end of the, um, the presentation. Thanks, John. Good morning, everyone. <clears throat> so we're just gonna talk through a couple of those, um, those rules that you can select because these tend to be the two most popular ones that are used by our customer. So what you can see here on the screen, you've got four production orders, numbers one to four. They will come in on the top left-hand side and they might be sort of a mishmash, um, you know, coming in at different times. And each of those is going to have a delivery date. If you're scheduling in something like Excel or Project, then you might just pick those up and say, right, I'm going to schedule the 
the first due date uh, job first, and then the next one, then the next one, and do it in that sort of sequence. And to do that, you would see that the sequence then would be uh, PO02, then 01, then 03, and then 04, based on those delivery dates. And the last two have the same delivery date, but it would then, you would probably pick the one that came in first, i.e. PO003. So if we see that as being planned out, the, the first job to be planned here is the earliest date, is the yellow one. Then it will plan the, the green one. Then it will plan PO003, the blue one, which is the first of the two with the same date. And then it will plan the last one, which is PO004. So this is the sort of scenario that you would get if we used uh, planning just by using the, the delivery date of the jobs. However, there might be a better method than this. So basically, um, what happens if we decide to use the lead time of the of the jobs, like the throughput time? So based on like the ideal scenario uh, of if I put this job on here, it can go from one operation to another straight away. The system could calculate the throughput time there of each of those in different individual jobs. By then subtracting that, that throughput time from the delivery date, we get this internal date that, that tells us the latest date that we can actually start that job in an ideal world in order to get it out on time. And then looking at that internal date, you can see that it would then take the earliest one and plan it first. So in this case, it would be the longest throughput time, the one with the 10 days, PO003, has got the earliest internal date of the 1st of the 1st. So we need to start this job by the 1st of January in order to, to move it through. So this scenario would give you a different look. So it would plan this longest lead time job through first, the one with the earliest internal date. So that would be the red one. Then it will put the, the green one on, because that's the next earliest internal date. Then it will put on PO002. And finally, it will put the blue one, PO003 on. And you can see there, we get a totally different look and feel to the screen. So in this scenario, if we look at the, at the delivery date, and we take the, the column along the top as being the 1st of January to the 11th, we can see that we've got all of these jobs in on time. But if we look and compare them together, we can see that if we do it by the delivery date, the red job there is going out past the 11th when it was due. So out of these two scenarios, the one for me that would be the best would be the fact that I've got the throughput time uh, scenario where I get everything on time. Because not only that, if you look at the delivery date scenario at the bottom part of the screen, you've also got capacity available at the front on the milling section, whereas in the throughput time, you're starting to use that capacity more. So it's a, a twofold win here in, in essence. This isn't a magic wand. It won't just suddenly make everything on time if you use um, scheduling by the throughput times. But it's just an example of the two main, the main sort of rules that our customers use and the differences that you can get by, by using them. And the fact that we have a very, very flexible system and you can do these, these what-if scenarios very quickly, it's a simple way of actually being able to, to choose and, and pick and, and try those different methods to see which one gives you the best actual effect. And we'll talk through some of those other scenarios in a moment. But I'm just going to hand back to John, who's going to talk you through interfacing on the shop floor. So we're going to move on and talk or we'll talk a little bit about um, interfacing to uh, third party systems. Typically, these are ERP, not exclusively, but quite commonly they are ERP systems. Um, I would say the majority of the systems that we integrate, certainly 85 to 90 percent, if not higher than that, are integrated to an ERP system because that generally has the works orders and operations and standard times. We don't want to reinvent the wheel. We don't want to re-enter that data. So we have a very flexible piece of middleware software that sits between the scheduler and the ERP system. Don't worry if your ERP system is not shown on this slide. This is just examples of some that we've integrated to, but we've yet to find a system that we're unable to integrate to due to the flexibility of our middleware software. It will require a little bit of um, input either from your internal um, experts in your ERP 
or alternatively the supplier of your ERP system, but we're very experienced in doing this and we have a whole series of user acceptance tests that we go through that will test all the different scenarios such as deleting operations, modifying quantities and such things. We have a small number of customers that operate the system standalone, but they tend to be smaller companies as well that, that find it not too onerous to actually keep the data up to date within the scheduler. So the sort of data that we take from the scheduler is typically the works orders, operations, the routings, standard times, bill of materials if we are scheduling the assembly um, or subsequent assembly, building of assemblies, um, and updates, things like changes in order quantity, changes in due date, things such as that. We call this a unidirectional interface because it comes from the ERP to the scheduler. Again, taking the most of our customers tend to bring the works orders and the operations through from their ERP, but some customers do purely bring the demand in terms of works orders and quantities and due dates and hold the operations and very detailed information pertinent to scheduling maybe in the scheduler. But the majority, all of the base data is, is in the ERP system. We can send data back from the scheduler. One example would be the plan start time. So if we send the plan start time on the first operation on the works order, then that's the required material delivery date that the ERP system can give us. In the same way, the ERP system can send um, earlier start date through to the scheduler when the material will actually be delivered. And secondly, if we're using our shop floor data collection, we can send actual times on when jobs start and finish and the quantities that have been booked. So I'm not going to through, go through every piece of detail on this slide, but this just shows you in the left-hand side, the mandatory information, the minimum amount of data that we need in order for the scheduling system to function if we're going to read this in from a third-party system. So you can see things like works order number, quantity, due date, standard times, the resource or resource group that the operations are routed to. There's then some ad optional fields um, I'll just draw your attention just to one, maybe the customer would, would be one that um, probably 50% of our customers use and maybe 50% don't. You may not use it if your customer is your warehouse or your assembly department, but if you are a subcontractor, for example, it's quite likely that you would make that customer um, visible on the works order as it goes through the shop floor. People making parts tend to understand the, um, the, the customer that it's required for. If we are passing data back, so on the right hand side, you see the Seeky Air. Seeky Air is our, is our um, browser based product and it includes shop floor data collection. And the WIP booking is the work in progress booking. Um, and this is the data that we can feed back to that ERP system. So the works order number, the operation number, um, the quantity that we've made and when we finished it and, and also when we started it. So having talked about some principles and interfacing to third party systems, I'm going to hand over to Neil again. Now, Neil's going to talk you through some of the key features. We're not intending to give you a live demonstration today. We're happy to organize that subsequently, but Neil's going to talk you through now some of the key features of the system so you'll understand more about its benefits and functionality. Thanks, John. Uh, so yeah, so we're just going to go through several slides just to give you some of the, the main features. There are others. Um, one of the first ones we're going to talk about is the ability to drag and drop and move move operations around. So once you've used one of the rules and, and given uh, given yourself your, your start point, your main schedule or new jobs have come in and, and you've scheduled those, you have the ability to move jobs around on their own singularly or operations as well. So we can we pick up an operation and we can drag it and move it somewhere else. We can move that uh, up or down the, the due date um, on that resource, or we could potentially, if need be, move it between resources if, if you know that the other resource has that ability to do it. So if we take, for an example, a job that's got five operations, um, most companies number them 10, 20, 30, et cetera, so we've got 10 to 50. If I decide to move op 10 and take it, move it backwards um, towards a, a later date, and it affects the subsequent operations 20 to 50, they will also move uh, along with it. So it will always keep operations in sequence. In the same manner, if I do it from op 50 and I decide I need to move that forward, it will actually move forward. And, it, and if it affects any previous ops of that job, it will also move those forward and force them in front of it. 
But in addition to this, we always adhere to the scheduling rules, the standard scheduling rules that have been set. So in general, we have a no overlap type policy. So when you bring it in initially, you would schedule it and, uh, and it would not overlap any ops. But also when you make these changes, it would have a, a, a consequence on potentially other jobs on that resource and then other subsequent and previous operations on different resources. So we get this real time ripple effect going through the whole system. So this gives us the flexibility to be able to, to move things around very quickly, very easily um, and make those changes. When we do make changes and we move things around, then we might create gaps in our capacity by doing that. So there's a thing that in the schedule called fill holes. That basically will fill up any unused capacity with any jobs that are, are potentially small enough to fit into that, that, that utilized capacity plan. Um, so it tries to automate everything as much as it can for you and keep your admin down to an absolute minimum. If we move things around or we reschedule, so if we do our drag and drops, then basically we want to know the consequence of that change. We want to know what we're affecting when we make that change. So there's a couple of columns uh, on the table here that, that we, we're going to be interested in. So if we bring them up here, we've got a column called deviation and we've got a column called impact. So the deviation column, there's five colors, red, amber, yellow, light green, and dark green. And you can configure that and set it to whatever tolerance that you'd like it to be. So for instance, if I have a job that's say a week or more late, it might highlight up as a red in the red tolerance band. If it's amber, then, uh, then it might be up to a week late. Yellow might be dead on time, light green up to a certain amount early and dark green earlier than that. So visually, very quickly, we can spot any problem potential jobs that, that are, are kind of going to be late, um, either at the front end of the schedule where you're doing all of your detailed planning or further down, like there's a heads up as to, to something's coming up that's going to be a problem in the future. So if we make those drag and drop changes or if we do a reschedule with one of our rules, we also get this impact column um, up here with colored arrows, the red and the green arrow in it. So a green arrow um, is a good thing. We've improved it by the number of days that it says in the impact column. And a red arrow is the opposite. It's moved uh, the end date of the job out by that number of days as well. By comparing that next to the deviation column, it gives you a quick heads up and to say, right, um, here's some information about what you've changed. Is this the best thing to do? And looking at this sort of scenario here, I've got green arrows there that have made improvements. I've got a red arrow on about the fourth job down. So it's actually gone out a little bit, but it's green. It's still on time. Uh, down near the bottom, I've got a job that's three days late in the amber color and one at the bottom that's two days late. We've actually got green arrows against those and they've actually been improved a little bit. So in this scenario, I would probably say that I'm, I'm good to go and I, I might well save that. But if I don't like it or I want to try something else, I can either go back to my last safe state or I can save it as what we call a, a what if scenario in, a, in what we call a snapshot. I can do as many snapshots as I wish. So I could change the scenario again, save it, change it, save it. And then I can look and assess those different, uh, them, them different snapshots. And we get a graph to say how many jobs we've got in each of our tolerance bands. So it gives you a very quick heads up as to which may be the best solution for you to use from those, those what if scenarios. If I want to, I can then have it on, on multiple screens and I can view the snapshot and I can view the current schedule and compare data and have a look at it. I can then load the snapshot that I want and then I could save it as my live schedule. When we're planning, uh, one of the key, key points, a uh, key piece of information on the KPIs that people want is to know their capacity and utilization. So here um, on the screen, we can see that, uh, that we can get our instant live capacity and utilization figures. The small bar across the top with the, the, like the green hills in it, we can adjust that to be whatever time period you want to view ahead. And the green hills are our, our capacity. And in most cases, the further out the right you go, then the bigger, bigger the green hills will get um, because you're, you're getting an increase in your capacity unless your order book goes out a very long way. Then there's a red rectangle around that. So we can again set the time period of that red rectangle and we can set when we want it to start. So. In the top part, you can just see the rectangle along, along the top. So for that period of time, it will then report on everything that's within it in the next two sections down. So in the first section in the middle, um, it gives us things like uh, our resource name. It will give us our percentage of utilization over the, that period. Um, we can again 
use color coding for very visual representation. So red bear might be above 90%, you're getting towards a bottleneck scenario. It will highlight our utilization percentage. It will give us things like how many hours have I made available on my shift, how many hours are being used, uh, how many hours are free on each resource. And also it will give us the biggest gap in that resource for that period of time. So that's quite useful if someone wants to have a look and, and there's an inquiry for a new job. Do we have enough time to make that job on the resources I know it needs to go on in that period of time? And in the bottom part of the screen, yeah, the, the green highlights are where the biggest uh, gap starts, which week. And the numbers in the boxes depend on the view mode that you've selected there. It could be the amount of hours being used per resource per week. It could be the shift pattern that you've allocated to it or it could be the amount of free hours that you've got per week there. So again, it's this, this really good heads up as to where you're gonna have bottlenecks, where you've got capacity that you might need to fill. John mentioned that we can control individual components and we can also control um, and keep an eye on kits of parts or, or assemblies. So in this example, at the top part of the screen, we've got this butterfly valve assembly. The butterfly valve assembly is made up of a list of parts that are underneath it. And you can see that they're indented. So for instance, they're about the fourth job down, you've got the collet and then you've got a face plate above it. They're parts that go into a sub-assembly called the valve spindle. That's a sub-assembly that goes into the valve arm and that goes into the top level butterfly valve assembly. So these are basically like children parent relationships between each of the different parts. And you can also see just below the collet, We've got a valve housing sub-assembly and that's made up of a butterfly valve and connector. Because it's indented, it will assume that and take that as a rule when it's scheduled. So it will say, I need to schedule the connector and the butterfly valve before I do the valve housing. I need to schedule the collet and the faceplate before the valve spindle, etc. And you can see two of those parts, the faceplate and the butterfly valve are actually showing up as late. Um, they're, they're in the amber color. But my top level assembly, the item that I'm delivering to my customer, um, the butterfly valve assembly is still on time. I'm actually seven days early with it. So I'm still happy, I'm still good, because the thing I'm actually delivering is, is good to go still. If I make changes to my schedule, it obviously may, may have an effect on these different parts and therefore on the top level assembly. And again, that will be highlighted up with the, <coughs> the, the, uh, the arrows that we looked at, the red and green arrows. So we can, again, keep an eye on what we're doing and how we're affecting our different kits or assemblies if, if that's what we're doing. Sometimes um, we need to have a delay between operations. Um, so we've got something in the system, it's called a wait time. So with the wait time, it, it could be used for things like if I need to stress relieve some material, so I rough it out and it has to sit for maybe 24 hours before I can go on to the next operation. Um, it might be that I glued something, it needs to cure, I painted something, it needs to dry, that sort of thing, or I can move on. So we can fit in a wait time against the, the operation and it will then delay the scheduling of the next operation for that period of time. Uh, even if I drag and drop it or automatically schedule it, it will, it will know this wait time unless I remove it. So it gives us again this, this improved accuracy. If I know that I have to wait for things, I don't want to have the next operation scheduled right behind the previous one because that's not possible to do. So we need to, to be as accurate as we can uh, as we go through and plan the schedule. So I'm just going to hand back to John and he's going to explain how we can drive data down onto the shop floor that's synchronized with the scheduler to give us these prioritized. Thank you, Neil. <clears throat> so the output of the schedule that we produce using those, those features that, that Neil's just shown you, potentially you could print it out and you could walk down to the shop floor with it and you could give it to the operator on each machine, you could pin it on a board. Um, the danger is that it gets out of date very quickly. As soon as a job overruns, then the subsequent schedule downstream of that is going to change because operations will flow through onto other resources. So it's important that we can distribute any changes to the schedule very quickly um, and as close to real time as possible to the operator, but also that we get their feedback on the progress of work on the shop floor. So what you see on the screen at the moment is a screen that we've taken from Seeky Air and it's an electronic work queue. So you can see that we've got a connector at the top, followed by a bearing front, followed by a connector. Those are, that's the order that we pro 
to produce the work in. Neil being my planner scheduler, he's going to be trying some different scenarios. We've got some rush orders come in. Do we need to change this? Well, if we do, then that rush order or that operation on that rush order could slip in front of all the others, except for the one that's running currently. Your planner can never change the work that is running on the machine. The operator would need to pause that operation. So this is how we're distributing the information down. Using some of the buttons on the screen there, we can also collect information on when operations start, when they finish, um, and any quantities that we've made. There's three ways I suppose you could do that. One, you could have the traditional manual timesheet. The operator fills it in. Somebody walks it into the office and somebody types it back into the system. There is a delay, usually at least 24 hours delay, if not more. The other option is you use a shop floor data collection system. So the Seeky Air system works well because not only um, are we collecting the data, but we're using exactly the same screen to display that electronic work queue. And the operator can just tap on each, each job on the queue to say that you started it or finished it. Alternatively, if you have an existing shop floor data collection system, then you could use that. That's probably going to be already implemented into your ERP system. So the ERP system then back flushes that data back down to the scheduler. So not only do we just get the demand, but we get the WIP updates as well. But as you'll see later, that's only part of the story um, in some of the data that we could use more effectively to improve the accuracy of the schedule. So on this slide now, what we're doing is we're, we're displaying how we can connect, collect the activities within the life cycle of that operation. I've explained how we can say when it starts and when it finishes, but what about understanding how long it took to set the job? Because we're going to be scheduling a set time, typically a set time per batch, and then a run time per part, although that can vary depending on the resource. Um, and you can see that the black line there indicates the plan time. So you can see in this example that we've slightly underrun on the setting time. So that's good. That's better than expected. But our production time for the batch is overrun. And we have some KPIs within CQ Air that we can actually report on this. And we're using that production time is coming from our machine monitoring module. So we're directly connected into the machinery. So we know exactly how long that, that machine has actually been running and how long it's taken to produce the parts. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that with one of the scenarios later on in the, in the presentation. So speaking of which, we're going to move on. And, and I'd, I'd like to think, um, whilst the, the earlier part of the presentation has been informative and helpful, I think this bit may, may be, um, maybe touch a, a few nerves for some of you within, the, uh, within your organization. Because what we're going to do now is we're going to um, pose some questions. And the questions or scenarios will be things that I think at least one or more of them will ring true if you are sitting in a planning seat or have any responsibility for planning and scheduling. So I'm going to play the role of the operations manager, managing director, and Neil's going to be my planner scheduler. Um, and as usual, I just assume that my planner scheduler will solve every problem that I've got and still get the work out on time. So the first question I'm going to pose to Neil is that we've just got a machine broken down. Yet we expect that it could be broken down for the rest of the shift, if not in tomorrow. Or alternatively, I've got an operator who's a key operator, and he or she, the equipment they, they were asking them to run, they're not available to run it and no one else can do it. So in effect, I've changed my capacity. So Neil, how could you help me deal with that and understanding the, the impact of that? Okay, so there's a, a couple of scenarios that we can use here. Um, in the graphic on the right, you can see eight hours and 30 minutes. That's the amount of hours available on that shift, on that resource. So as John said, if that resource breaks down right now and I can't run it, I could put zero in there and I can close it. It will push jobs backwards on that resource and have the knock-on effect on, on everything else, that ripple that we talked about. So if I absolutely can't run this resource, then that's what I would have to do. So if my, my machine's broken down or my I, I've got a worker who's not turned up because they're sick and I can't do anything, I would close it. But I can also try some other scenarios to help me try to get back on track. I could then increase hours on that resource for a day or a number of days um, and see what effect that gives me. I could move operations to other resources if it's possible to do so. Um, I could start to do things like like split operations, which we're talking about a little bit in, in a moment. So, so 
what you're basically doing is is sending back the real um, reason as to, to why that can't run to make your schedule accurate again. So if I can't run it, I've got to close it. So let's take another example here. And this, I'm sure, unless you are in a very fortunate position, in which case maybe you wouldn't be on this webinar. Um, what about if I don't have enough available capacity? So we have a certain capacity within our business. We've got a set number of works orders that we need to produce. But whatever we seem to do, we don't seem to have enough capacity unless we can somehow change that capacity or deal with it and deal with that issue in a different way. So, Neil, what, what different options do we have there? Look, okay, we've got a couple of options here. Um, one, we could look at trying to increase capacity if we have that, that possibility. Um, we could add more hours, as we looked at before. If that doesn't give you any sort of a, a result that, that you're looking for, then we can actually select either uh, uh, operations of that works order and and or the, the whole works order, and we can decide that we might want to try and outsource this and subcontract it. In that case, we can actually select, if we put them in there, the supplier that we're going to send it to. We can tell the system how many days we're expecting that, that job to be out of, out of the, the plant for. Um, and, and even on what days um, you might be delivering it. Uh, and it would then put it to a subcontract external operation, um, which would then move it from that resource and increase capacity on that resource, which would be filled by other jobs. So you can do that on a on a piece by piece sort of basis, if you like. Um, and it again is a what if scenario. So you can decide whether or not it suits. And if not, then go back and revert to the original plan. So this one, I'm sure, has hit us all at one time or another. So we've got a critical job. Maybe it's a job for a, a particular customer. Maybe it's even a group of jobs. But something has changed. We expected to get this job out on time, and something has changed. Maybe we've had a machine break down, whatever the reason is, and now it's going to be late. So I want to see if there's any chance that we can still deliver this job on time. Neil, how could we look at doing that? Again, we've got several options. One is the drag and drop that we mentioned earlier. You could move this job to the front and see what it affects and, and see if it gets it on time for you. Um, we could also consider rescheduling and maybe we want to reschedule by, by priority. So we could give this job a high priority um, and then obviously schedule down to the lower priority jobs as we go through. You wouldn't do that with every single job because that's that's not feasible. But for these jobs that are high priority, we could we could use uh, the, the priority scheduling model to do that. Uh, and we can then see the consequence and decide whether that is something we want to do again. Oh. <clears throat> so maybe um, I've just implemented the scheduler because my on-time delivery performance isn't good. Maybe I've even been running the scheduler for a while and I've improved my on-time delivery performance, but I want to go a step further. So um, whichever scenario that you're in, the, the assumption is, I think, if you're on this webinar, that you, you aren't able to routinely deliver all of the product that you need on time. Um, and that's why you're looking at a system that is maybe that will help you do that uh, more effectively. Or alternatively, maybe you are able to deliver on time, but it's consuming a huge amount of um, people's time in order to achieve that. So how can I try and improve my on-time delivery performance, Neil? Okay, um, so again, another, a number of options here. Um, if we can't increase our, our capacity or, or subcontracting isn't the way to go, we could try overlapping operations. So we can, we can allow an operation to overlap the previous one by either a percentage or a quantity of the previous parts. Um, so we could try that. Um, if not, we could maybe consider splitting operations. So maybe the customer will take half of the, the, the order right now. So we could split it down and, and do half now and half later. Or maybe I split an operation and I run it in parallel across multiple resources at the same time. And that can help me then move the next operations and subsequent operations forward. So again, it's all about the flexibility of the system, being able to do things very quickly. You can choose how you might want to try to, to address that, and it will give you the consequence of those changes to let you make that informed decision. So this this next scenario may not apply to all of you, but I'm one of the, the type of business or a, a type of business that this is quite useful um, or would, would crop up. 
is maybe subcontract where you have various um, capacities across different types of, of resources. So you might have a, a plating shop, you might have a, a, a milling shop, you might have a turning shop, you might have a deep hole boring um, machine, for example. And the sales team are focused on selling as much of that capacity as possible. And if there's free capacity, then the, the push is on, the incentive is on for them to sell that capacity. How can we, how can they see Neil, what it is, what capacity they need to sell. Yeah. Okay. So um, we have a master planner who does all the changes and they save the schedule. Other people, obviously, such as the sales team or, or maybe others in, in the organization, might want access to that data. So, um, in order to be able to see everything that the master planner can see on their software, we have a couple of modules one called Viewer and one called Simulation. Um, they're slightly different in the way they work, but they give you all the data still. So, if it's say for the sales department, they could use this and view the view the workload view that we, we looked at earlier. They could see which machines or resources are, are overutilized currently um, and which ones are underutilized. And they could then focus and target on getting work in for those underutilized resources and just be aware that if they start taking more work in for these overutilized resources, they're going to have a problem in the delivery of them. Um, so by using this, we can look at sort of mixing and getting the right type of work into the company to, to utilize the capacity to its maximum. Uh, something else that, that um, you, you may be a, a challenge, especially in the current somewhat uncertain climate, is that um, I'm wanting to preserve my cash. So I want to reduce my stock and I want to reduce my lead time. So if I get an order, I want to be able to ship it as quickly as possible. But at the same time, I don't want to be holding a lot of finished goods or raw material in stock. So how can the scheduler help me with that, Neil? Okay, so as we said before, when we plan, uh, we know the start date of every job and the, the first operation, we know the end dates. We can use these start dates to, to sort of either feed back into our ERP, as, as John mentioned before, so that you can order material through it, or a report or something that tells us that, that we've got these jobs starting on this week and, and we know the lead time of the material for that, plus maybe a buffer. We could have an exceptions list that says, right, you need to order this material um, at this point. So you'd only be ordering the material in when you need it. It wouldn't be just sitting there in stock and, and you spend money on it and you're not actually doing anything with it yet. Um, we can start to do things like um, make sure that, that we, we use our scheduling rules wisely and we try to keep our whip down to a minimum. Um, we can also um, use it to prioritise whip. So maybe I'm coming up towards end of week or end of month or end of year and I want to get the work I've started, um, if I can, and my customers will take it, I want to get it finished and then I can get it out, ship it out and, and be paid for it. So. Um, Again, doing things like the splitting operations and overlapping and getting things through faster can all be maybe to get to that point. Um, but the tools are there and the flexibility is there within the um, Another option here, if you are in the position where you manufacture in-house, but at times you also subcontract, again, thinking of the, the, the current economic situation, if I want to reduce my costs, I want to see if I can bring some of that work back in house and, and what impact would that have? Would that really make any difference on, on delivery times? Is it going to push delivery times out? Um, so how can we look at, at, in effect, changing the routing on the part and now doing it um, in house as opposed to subcontracting it, Neil? Okay, so again, we've got these what, what if scenarios. So if we've got capacity and we don't want to be spending money on outsourcing that work, we can look at changing that back and making it an operation on a resource within our system. We can then bring that in and, and see what that, that consequence is and, and you know how much time we actually need to do it in-house. And we can, again, make those informed decisions. It's, it's all about the flexibility and, and knowing and, and having the knowledge to make those decisions in the right way. So without doing these sort of what ifs, then, then you're not going to really know what the best thing is that, that you can do. And, and to do that manually is very difficult. Okay. Um, we, uh, I touched on the shop floor data collection earlier. So, so here's an example where um, the customer's demanding some keener pricing, um, as I guess a lot of your customers commonly do. Um, and we, we want to try and improve the margin. So they're, they're pretty insistent that they want a keener price. 
um, what I've got to do is try and reduce my costs in order to improve my margin if they're going to have a keener price. So how can I look at doing that, Neil? So again, um, we've been using uh, shop floor data collection. So whether it be the CTA with booking or whether it be the third party system, we can collect the duration of the, the operation from start to finish as a minimum. But if we start to do a little bit more than that um, on a third party SFDC or in, in air alongside monitoring, we can pick up, like John showed earlier, the setting time and the production time. So there's an example we report here. Analyzing a certain part, we can look at every time we've done this part, we can look at every operation and how long it took to set, how long it took to run, and then we can get the average amount uh, there for each of those operations. We could then hone those times, um, put them back into our ERP if that's where we're pulling it from, or if we're holding the, the, shape, the routing data within the scheduler, then we could update those times there. And therefore, we're come, becoming more accurate of our planning, more accurate with our costings. Um, so it's going to help us to, to look at maybe improving our costs for that customer. Okay, thank you, Neil. Thank you very much. That's really helpful, guys. Thank you. Um, we did have a few questions come in whilst you were talking, so I'm just going to go through some of those now. Um, can you define if a part should be done in... Uh, how can you define if a part should be done in three different machines on the shop floor? Um, that's the first question, Neil. Okay, so um, obviously defining it is, is the matter of just splitting it. You can, you can right click on the operation and you can tell it into how many how many parts you want to split it down into or, or different quantities for those parts. Um, as for deciding whether or not to do it, I think that's going to be down to things like how loaded the, the resource is, and where you and how loaded the resource you want to move it to is, how urgent the job is. So that's a decision for you to make. But to actually do the splitting is really simple, and you can split it into, like I say, a number of parts or quantities. You can try that, and if it doesn't work out for you, you even have the possibility before you start any of those on the shop floor, you can bring them all and join them all back together again. So again, it's this flexibility and what if type scenario. Just, just to make sure we've understood the question correctly, and I think that is probably the intention of the question, but I wasn't sure, George, if you were talking about um, how you would route the operation to three different machines. So maybe, Neil, it's just worth just briefly touching on resource grouping for a second. Okay, alternative resources, yeah, okay. Um, so, yeah, um, we can group resources together. So three machines will be the same. Then group them them uh, just mills for instance for now and then i've got three exactly the same milling machines under it um we can make that the the, the uh, resource on the routing could be called mill for instance and then we can then tell it which resources are in that group in the scheduler so when it comes to schedule we can actually use a little feature called ard automatic resource distribution and it will take it from that non-existent machine the mill and it will put it onto one of the real ones by keeping the the efficiencies balanced up Alternatively, if it is alternative routings, um, then there is a way of doing that in a, in a rule and tell the system what machines this, this job can potentially be done on. And then it would be all in one group, but it would only put it to one of the resources that have been uh, selectable, if you like. So there's a couple of ways of, of going about that, if that's the, the, the question. Okay, thank you very much. I hope that did answer the question, George. If not, drop me a message and we'll, we'll make sure we cover that for you. Um, another question was, we have all the part information required in CISPRO. Can we pass that to the CQ scheduler? Yeah, absolutely. As, as John mentioned before, the, the, uh, our module that sits between third-party systems and, and on that, uh, that screenshot that John showed you, CISPRO was one of the ERPs that we've done before. Um, so, uh, we would be able to take that data from CISPRO, um, the, the works order information, the, the routing information, and we could bring it in and, and put it into the scheduler database. So it'll be the live jobs, et cetera, that come in, and then they're ready to be planned. So you can then release them to the schedule and, and go and plan those jobs. Okay, great, thank you. Um, you talked about reducing available time on a resource. Is that done in the planning board view? Yes, it is the planning board. The time, the timeline view. We've got two graphical views. One's more like a Gantt type view, like you would see, uh, uh, you know, in in projects or something. 
Um, and then we've one, got one called Planning Board, and it's customers' preferences to which one they use. But you can only change the actual time uh, available on a, on a daily basis, like on the fly in the Planning Board view. Or you can go to Shift Patterns, but if you're just doing something very quickly, then, then you would do it in the Planning Board view. Great, thank you. Um, when you accept a what if, are those changes made automatically or do you need to make each line change manually? So when you, when you do a what if scenario, so if you, you change the schedule, drag and drop, reschedule, you save it as what we call a snapshot, you can then go away and do another what if and another what if. So until you actually save the schedule, it's all a what if scenario. So if you have done multiple what ifs and you're then looking at to which one you want to use, once you've decided, you would select that one, you would then load it and save it as your live schedule. So you could do these multiple what ifs and then you load the one that you want to use and save it. Okay, Matt, I hope that answered your question. Um, thank you. If um, Is it a cloud-based system or is it installed on-premise? It's uh, normally installed on-premise. It's a, it's a, a server-based system that the scheduler doesn't run from the cloud um, currently. Um, may, may well do in the future, but at the moment it does not. So it's a, a client-based relationship um, from your server. So you install the software on your server uh, the database, etc., and then we access it through a client on the PCs that are, are required to run it. Okie dokie. Um, I'm sorry, I don't know who ED is, but um, you asked if there's a live demo of the module planned. Um, I'm going to talk a bit about the follow up next, but that's something that we can we can definitely arrange to follow up with. So um, we we do have a series of um, live demos and webinars coming up. I'm sure we'll be doing a planning one as part of that, but we would do something a bit more tailored for you if you wanted to as well after this session. So um, thank you very much. Is Are there any other questions? Jamie, there was one that we'd missed from Ed, oh, which sorry. was about, um, I think when I was talking about putting the um, the ping pong balls in the glass tube, um, oh, which was saying, so, so sequencing equals planning. So maybe just the, the, the question was, so sequencing equals planning question mark. So let me just explain a little bit more. What I was talking about there is, and I can go into a little bit more detail about the principle of how the scheduling system schedules. And I, I would say, I think this is really critical when we conduct a training course, if you understand the way the system is operating, then it's much easier to understand the results that it, that it gives you, as well as, you know, if you get some unexpected results, you can understand how or why it's scheduled in the way it does. So the sequencing I was talking about is really a pre-processing of the list of works orders before the system tries to schedule them. And that's really what the scheduling rules do. So take Neil's example, we had delivery date. So in effect, what the system is doing is looking at all the works orders, ranking them by delivery date, and then the one with the earliest delivery date, it will schedule first. So all of those operations will follow nicely on sequentially. Let's assume there's no overlapping and there'll be no gaps between them. And then it will do the next order and the next order. And eventually gaps will appear where we've got the first two operations on an order scheduled, but the third operation has to wait maybe a couple of hours or a day to get on the next resource. And we start to get some gaps in our, in our works orders. The other scenario that Neil showed you was that we calculate in effect the latest start date of the, each of the orders based on that, that expected production time. We sort by that way. And there's a whole number of different methods that we can use, but that's, that's what we're really talking about with sequencing, as in sequencing the, um, the orders before the scheduling system almost starts to show them, but the scheduling system is doing it based on some criteria. Um, people use terminology such as balance flow or line balancing. So it, it's actually looking at how you can balance the work through the factory to make most effective use of it on a weekly, monthly, quarterly basis, depending on how your, your demand varies really. Certainly in aerospace, this is, this is quite typically done. Thank you for that, John. Thank you. Um, any other questions? I know we're coming to the end of our time now, the, the hour time. So unless there's anything else, just have a quick look. No, I don't think so. Um, okay, thank you. So I appreciate your time today. Um, I hope that's been helpful. 
thinking about your planning and scheduling requirements going forward there's some questions here you might want to start having a little think about um, things about you know do you want to interface to in the ERP or MRP business system how many works orders you might be typically active on the shop floor what type of data do you want to pass back uh, do you, you know do you have a whip booking system in, in, in place already or are you looking at some kind of shop floor data capture so have a think about those questions and then if you wouldn't mind clicking me three thank you um i will be following up with everybody just to see you know your feedback your comments any outstanding questions we can then you know typically our process would be to arrange a call with one of our account managers so we can go through your specific requirements and just understand a bit about your processes and you can ask some questions and then obviously we can look at doing a tailored demo just to you know put it in context for you so we'll do all that with the follow-up so once again thank you so much for your time today thank you neil thank you john you, um and have a good rest of your day goodbye thank you all thank you all very much for joining bye-bye